Hello there. Hey, Richard. How are you? I'm great, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for your time. Uh, we now have uh, eight minutes to cover 50 years of history with your band, which uh, okay. is the impl- abbreviated version. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to start, get right into it and start off with kind of a two-part question. And in the very beginnings of Kansas, 50 years ago, I think your success may have been a combination, not just of your talent, but of time and place. And I want to start off with the place part of the question. Do you think Kansas would have sounded very different if you guys had moved to L.A. To, or or New York to try to make it in a scene? Because when you guys started, you were all born and raised in Kansas. You started playing music. You formed the band there. You did your first recordings there. You toured all over the state. But if you had, like, right away said, let's go to L.A. and try to make it, I mean, would, would we even be talking today? Probably not. And what was... You, unique about kansas just in general is people think you know how did they come out of the middle of nowhere it's like we had the radio stations we heard the same songs as you heard in chicago new york los angeles everywhere Uh, we had televisions even and we saw the beatles on ed sullivan all of those things happened and it was a very musical area there was um the generation before us had these 10-piece soul bands all in matching tuxedos and they are playing all over the whole Midwest. You were hearing the ads on the radio all the time, and it was very exciting that you could get a feel for what the lifestyle, you'd wonder, what would that be like to be doing that? And so it wasn't that unusual, really. What was you know different was radio then. You listen to AM radio, so you're hearing the Rolling Stones, you're hearing the Beatles, and you're hearing the Supremes, then you're hearing Johnny Cash. And maybe that station that night might be playing jazz or something, or classical music. And at that time, things weren't put in little boxes. And so you kind of got an influence of all of it. And so that's kind of where we came from, was influenced by just what you happen to like. And we all individually like things, some things in common and some things very differently. Uh, Carrie Lifflin was a lot more influenced by classical things, as was Robbie Steinhardt being a violinist. Dave Hope and I were played in a lot of lot of different soul bands and, and things like that. And heavily like the young rascals and the, the, again, the hits of the day. So it was not that unusual to come from that area. Had we come from a trend setting place that everybody was following the trail of the particular trend in that area at the moment, we would have probably too, but instead we just, all of us got together and brought our individual influences to the table and wanted to write something original that was not following a trend, but maybe something that was, We weren't concerned about setting a trend so much as we were more concerned with just being ourselves and doing things the way we wanted to do it. My second kind of part of that question is the time. We're talking the early 70s, and the music business is very different. And you were, you guys hooked up with Don Kirshner, and for people to know this, yes, the same Don Kirshner from Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, which I watched religiously as a kid, and his partner, Wally Gold. Now, these guys, very different from now, a lot of record execs then believed, had a belief in their artists. They had a belief in the band. And these two guys really believed in Kansas. And now it's like you put out one album, and if it doesn't do well, they dump you. But they stuck with you. And even though you made those first few albums were great, you weren't making a lot of money, and that was kind of hurting them, you know, until Left Overture. Do you think that if you hadn't hooked up with someone like Don Kirshner, uh, the band would be in a different place? Well, you're correct. I mean, a lot of record companies were kind of putting you out in, in, on the farm team and letting you mature and find out who you were. Uh, and Kirshner did it maybe more than most. Uh, it's unique for, you know, the, he was when we got to meet him, he was known as the monkey man because of the monkey's TV yeah. show. Yeah. We thought it was an awfully odd fit. And he was really our benefactor. Uh, you would think he would be hands-on, and he was really the opposite. After the first album we did in New York and Wally Gold sat in the producer's chair from that moment on we were on our own we uh second album we did in los angeles because we really liked the sound of the studio the crosby stills and nash was using Mm. and their vocal blend so we chose that and they just gave us a bunch of money and said go make a record and the third album mask we decided to go to the middle of the swamp in louisiana (laughs) to be away from distractions and again sure here's some money go make an album they left us alone rather than pressure us to let us find ourselves. And that paid off with Left Overture because you could hear this gradual evolution of us becoming ourselves. And that maturity happened during uh, the Left Overture project. 
and that exploded. And Don Kirshner suddenly at the country club had bragging rights because I'm sure his friends were going, what are you thinking with these hayseeds from Kansas? And he, <laughs> I, I hear something there. I think there something will happen with this. And finally he was right. Yeah, that's it's your, your beginnings are a really uh, amazing story. And now you're looking back on 50 years. You've got the, the three CD retrospective out there. You're doing the, the another fork in the road tour. So uh, getting ready for this tour, I'm sure you're going through the set list and stuff. Is there any of your music that maybe has, that you've gone back to that has surprised you at all? I don't go back that often and, and listen. You know, I don't sit around and listen to Kansas records. Right, uh, and there's right. some things I hadn't heard in years. But like getting ready and p- going playing stuff or trying stuff out, is there anything you were like, oh, wow, I forgot about this. Well, this that, is, that's, yeah. that's the thing. And, you know, with this project, I started going back and going to like Don Kirshner's rock concert and seeing, you know, live songs of that time. And just going, wow, that was a great band. Now, this is live, and we're up there scared to death. <laughs> uh, you know, Flying out from playing bars in Kansas to suddenly on stage with cameras in your face playing this complicated material. And wow, that was a tight band. And so yeah, it's very exciting to go jump back in those shoes and relearn that, that material. That's what we're all at home doing now is, is homework, is yeah. relearning stuff that we haven't played in 35 years. Well, you'll be here in Worcester at the Hanover Theater on October 12th. Looking forward to seeing the, the the songs you guys have picked for the this this fifty year retrospective. It's definitely not the Ellingwood Opera House, but it is a beautiful theater. Um, <laughs> yeah, I believe I've been there before. Oh, and, good. Yeah, so you know, it's a lovely place. Yeah, and yeah, very look, look, love playing in that area. I want to ask: Is the Ellingwood Opera House still standing? No, there is a plaque there, and oh. there's a kind of a little hippie, some kind of a health food store or something that's there. Oh. Uh, but, you know, they tore it down um, quite a while ago now. Oh, okay. uh, it was, I mean, there's nothing, it's a very small town that had one of the last things standing in it. I mean, the town was probably 10 by 10 blocks. <laughs> and in the middle of it was this old op- opera house. And we could rent the place for, I think it was 135 bucks. <laughs> and they put somebody at the front door and charge them a quarter to get in. That's unbelievable. That's a, such a great story. So that that people don't know, that's the gig that got Kansas signed. Wally Gold came out to see you, and it wasn't only just a quarter to get in, but you were giving out free beer, which is a mark, well, just marketing was, genius. Marketing genius. Yeah. Well, we didn't. Uh, we were not the ideal bar band, and <laughs> because we were playing a lot of cover material, the bar the uh, bar owners didn't care for it, and we would rewrite popular songs of the day because we couldn't stand the versions that we were being forced to play. And so it's not like we drew a big crowd ever. <laughs> and so when Wally Gold called us and said, I'm coming out in two weeks to, to audition you guys, I thought, oh, crap, what are we going to do? So we rented the opera house. Well, the the conundrum was, who, who's going to come? <laughs> you know, this place is going to look bad with 30 people in it. I said, what if we give away free beer? <laughs> and so suddenly the place was stuffed to the rafters. There's people outside that couldn't get in because of the capacity <laughs> limits. And Wally Gold calls Curse and says, man, there's something really going on here. This out in the middle of nowhere, and there's people riding in on their tractors, and they can't even get in. There's so many people there. And, of course, they're all drunk, and so they're all screaming. They don't know what we're doing. They don't care. They're just in there for the free beer. But it got us a record deal. Yeah. So we got it by, by free beer and wine. That's awesome. Well, looking forward to seeing you at the Hanover Theater October 12th. If you want to offer free beer at that show, I'm all for it. But either way. <laughs> Coming to see you. Uh, Richard Williams from Kansas, thank you so much for taking the time today. We appreciate it. Congratulations on 50 years of Kansas. Oh, can't wait to be there. Thank you so much, Mike.